So good evening. Tonight is Sunday, March 5th, and this is Biz Communications 310. And tonight we're talking about several different activities. We're talking about persuasive messages. I'm going to go over the resources tonight, go over the expectations for the week, and of course a friendly reminder that on Friday at 5.30 at American River College, we will all be meeting together in LA 122 that's Liberal Arts 122, for our activity where we meet our teammates and learn all about your group project. So it's a pretty exciting time. Uh, I will assure you of one thing, so to minimize the anxiety. The project that is your group project is comprised of weekly activities that I guide very carefully using Google Docs so that I can see what you're doing as well as all of your classmates to interact online very, very easily without having to meet physically. But I also guide your activities from week to week that involve building your presentation. So I kind of want to remove the anxiety from that now. Okay, so I'm going to change my settings. The information tonight should uh, be contained within about 22 to 24 minutes. All right. We're going to begin by saying that this week we're talking about persuasive messages. If you look at the course syllabi, we are a week behind, but this week we will have the opportunity to catch up and be back on task by next week, just in time to start gearing up for spring break. So here we go. Let's go to modules together. And within the modules, once again, everything is laid out very similar as it has been in the past. So when you go to persuasive messages, you will have the study questions for the week, and there are four. It will be followed by four independent videos discussing each study question on the topic of persuasion. Then you will have also the slides themselves with the script, but I want to talk about the topic of persuasion. So I put a couple resources for you. One of the things that's so important that we understand is there's a huge difference between per persuasion and manipulation, and especially in business. One has an underlying tone of deceit, which is manipulation, versus persuasion, which is enlightenment, and often getting others to see. There are three different techniques that we use, and there's logos, ethos, and pathos. So when we talk about logos, this is the argument itself. It appeals to reasoning. So this is when you're speaking or sharing an idea, and you've got theories, scientific facts, data to back you up, definitions, quotes, citations, informed opinions, examples, personal antidotes. Then there's those that are ethos, which really appeal to the character and ethics. This is when you have a speaker or a professional who speaks of their own background or publications. They appear sincere. They're ethical. The language that they use is very viable. It's appropriate vocabulary, grammar. So they are very, quote, unquote, believable. Then there is the highly popular pathos, which is emotion. And this is where you use emotionally loaded language, vivid descriptions, emotional examples. Uh, often the commercial that always comes to my students' mind is Sarah McLaughlin and the music in the background with the SBCA. Antidotes, testimonials, figurative languages, emotional tone. Now, you need to understand that all of these will have a different effect on your audience. So, let's talk about that. And I'm going to enlarge just a little bit here so it makes it easier for you to see. All right. So, when you talk about logos versus ethos versus pathos, logos invokes that cognitive rational reasoning like, oh, that makes sense. And then when you have that logical reasoning, people all of a sudden can connect the dots versus ethos, which helps the reader kind of come along and see the reader is trustworthy and you build that relationship. Pathos, 
on the other hand. So remember, when we're talking about this logos, ethos versus pathos, this evokes emotional response, also um, potentially visceral. So fear, sympathy, empathy, or anger. So how do we talk about it? Well, the author in a logos defines relative terms, then uses the support claims. In ethos, scientific terminology, but the author builds ethos by demonstrating their own expertise or credibility. Pathos, I often think of 911. And this is where you're eliciting emotions, anger, etc., from the reader. So this handout that I provided for you will give you kind of a quick direction as to understanding when we talk about the relationship between arguments. Now I'm going to share now as I do this, I do have my chat up, but I do want um, at least one of you to confirm that you can see a slide right now. That is refers to the rules. Awesome. Thank you. Naraj, you're awesome. So let's talk a little bit about what we call the commitments of logical fallacies. And this is what you have to be very, very careful of when we have arguments in the business world. There's a slippery slope. This is when <laughs> you say, it's a conclusion. If this happens, then this will happen. And if this happens, then this will happen. And you continue to go on until you may perhaps end up with a very strong fallacy of this slippery slope. So an example is, if we ban Hummers because they're bad for the environment, then eventually the government will ban all cars. Because, and so thus, we should not ban Hummers. Now, you and I both can look at this logically and say that's a ridiculous statement. But it's when an author takes one point and then continues it down to an illogical end. That is not effective in the workplace. Hasty generalization. This is when you have a conclusion with really insufficient information. So, example, even though it's only the first day, I can tell this is going to be a boring course. We've all been there, done that. But however, that's a hasty generalization and that can cause problems. Post hoc ergo promptu hoc. Now, this is a conclusion that assumes if A occurred after B, then B must have been caused by A. But that's not always the course, right? So, I drank a bottled water and now I'm sick. So, the water must have made me sick. Not necessarily because we're missing information. Perhaps there was previous illness. Perhaps there was other previous exposure. Let's continue. Genetic fallacy. This is where you have an argument and the conclusions are based upon the origins of the person, the idea, the institute, the theory. So here's an example. The Volkswagen Beagle, Beetle sorry, is an evil car because it was originally designed by Hitler's army. Kind of an extreme statement, but it is a perfect example how the two are completely inherently not related. Begging the claim. Begging the claim is the term we refer to when um, the conclusion that the writer provides, okay, is validated within the claim. So this is filthy and polluted coal should be banned, okay? And this argue that coal pollutes the earth and thus should be banned because it's logical. But the very conclusion that should be proved that coal causes enough pollution to warrant banning its use is already assumed in the claim, filthy and polluting. So that's begging the claim. Circular arguments. We hear this a lot. This is where you restate the argument instead of proving it. It's from the same school of thought that the louder you yell, the weaker your argument. Perfect example. George Bush is a good communicator because he speaks effectively. That is a circular argument. Either or. This is a conclusion that oversimplifies an argument by saying that there's only two options. We can either stop using cars or destroy the earth. 
No, because you and I both know that there's other options, such as creating cars that are perhaps less destructive to the earth. Ad hominem. Now, this is an attack on the character of a person rather than his or her opinions. We hear this a lot, especially when it comes to personal attacks in the press. Green pieces strategies aren't effective because they are all dirty, lazy hippies. That speaks for itself. Ad populum, and this is an emotional appeal, really pathos. It speaks to positive uh, patriotism, religion, democracy, all those feel good things or negative that are visceral such as terrorism or fascism if you were a true american you would support the rights of people to choose whatever vehicle they want red herring this is a very diversional tactic and it really avoids any key issues by avoiding the opposing argument rather than confronting them head on the level of mercury in seafood may be unsafe but what will fishers do to support their families? Again, two different points. Level of mercury in food, fishers supporting their families. The straw man. This is where you oversimplify the opponent's point of view, and then you attack that hollow document, that hollow argument. So people who don't support the proposed state minimum wage increase hate the poor. Moral equivalence. This fallacy compares minor misdeeds to major atrocities. So, for example, the parking attendant who gave me a ticket is as bad as Hitler. Okay, little overstatement. Perfect examples. Okay, I'm going to go back and to these fallacy slides are available for you on your canvas. Monroe's motivated sequence is a powerful tool to use. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about that in the book, but I want to talk about detail. When we talk about the motivated sequence, it goes something like this. Attention. You get the audience's attention. Then you have a need. Describe the problem. Demonstrate the need followed by satisfaction and this is a practical concise solution then visualization allowing the students to picture the results and then action i'm going to kind of demonstrate that now in the textbook there is a case study and i'm going to go to chapter five here i'm going to make sure the case scenario. Take just a minute to load. Terrific. Okay, so in this particular case scenario, let's get rid of that. In this particular case scenario, what I want you to look at is bring this down here go to check out my chat real quick make sure you're all okay okay excellent perfect this scenario talks about starting a new business and I'm just gonna briefly kind of go over the high details for you you have Kelly and Noah and they are both college students that are in college together and one of them is steady business and the other one has um, a big family history in um, the topic of animal care and so they get together and they decide they want to start their own business. The problem is, is if they're both students, they have no money, they go to the bank, and when they go to the bank, the bank says, well, hey, you know, we'd love to give you money, but you have to get somebody to co-sign. So they decide they're going to go to their parents and ask their parents to co-sign. And in the process of getting their parents to co-sign, they have to start working through this concept of persuasion in how they're going to talk to their parents. And through this different case study, they're thinking through all the questions their parents are going to ask. And their parents are going to ask some really logical things like, hey, you know, you're too young to start a business. What experience do you have? Have you looked into the type of business you want? And the type of business they want is they want 
Pet Haven, which is a, um, basically it's a doggy daycare. And through this case study, it walks you through the paces of different questions you would ask yourself. And ultimately, through this brainstorming process, it comes to how you ask your parents for money, then you get funded, and then what would your letter look like to introduce your business? So if we look back at your Monroe's motivated sequence of attention, need, satisfaction, visualization, action, I want to show you a letter and an example of a business communication that would be a good example. So in this here, given that certain scenario, I've created an example letter for you here. And we're going to read over this together. I'll move my chat to the other side. Okay. So consider now you have your funding, but we want to now reach out to our community. And using Monroe's sequence of do you have a need? How could we satisfy it? This is what you need to do all through the five steps. Let's take a look at this letter. Dear blank, would you like to make a positive difference in your pet's life? Give your best friend the gift of Pet Haven, a new daycare facility conveniently located at 500 Albemarle Drive. Here are the benefits you and your pet will enjoy at Pet Haven. So also notice even the format of this letter is easy to read with bullets and quick points. We've established a need, make it a difference in your pet's life. Well, now we've got the solution. Personalize attention and hourly playtime with individual handlers. Socializing activities to improve pets' confidence and interaction with other animals. Daily workouts and games that exercise your pet physically and mentally. Clean and roomy containment areas, plus comfort rooms for anxious or overly excited pets. Full-time on-site veterinarian technicians available to answer your pet's questions and concerns. Discounts on pet training, routine grooming, supply toys, and boarding fees. Action step. Call us today to schedule your first complimentary daycare. Be sure your pet, you're, we're sure your pet will love the experience and you'll feel good about enhancing his daily routine. For more information, including a detailed price schedule, visit us at. So as you look at this example of communication, notice there's the attention step, the need, the satisfaction, the visualization, and the action. So this document here will walk you through each one of the steps in detail. This is a great guide as you talk about persuasion in the workplace, as well as using the motivational model even in your research paper. Let's talk about the assignments for this week. The assignments for this week include my BCom lab activities, chapter five, the warm up, all the way through the document makeovers. This week's discussion is based upon social persuasion and work earth justice. This is based out of the textbook and you'll want to review this case study and then respond to the prompt, how clear is the billboard? Which audiences are more likely to understand what actions they're being asked to take? Your written activity for this week is key concepts number one, A through E. For your reference, I've placed a little picture here of that particular assignment. This week, I've broken down the quizzes into four mini quizzes, one for each study question. There are 10 points for study question one, 10 points for study question two, 10 points for study question three, 10 points for study question four. This week is also midterm week. So I have given you two weeks to complete this midterm. Notice it is not due until March 20th. It is open note, open book, open brain. And not only that, but the questions that you see will be very similar to the questions that you have had in previous chapters. Remember, you can go back to previous chapters to review the correct answers. This is an easy 90 points. This midterm quiz covers chapters 1 through 5, 
and chapter 10. These are all the activities for Chapter 5, Persuasive Messages. Please remember that on Friday, March 10th, we'll be meeting at American River College at 5.30 p.m. We'll be talking about the group project. You'll be meeting with your teammates, and by the time you leave at 7.30 p.m., you will have everything that you need to be successful in your group project. We won't be meeting again until our final class meeting where you'll be presenting your class project. So tonight I talked about fallacies and persuasive messages. I've demonstrated and shown you the resources available. In addition, we've talked about the assignments and the expectations for the week. Are there any questions somebody would like to ask now? Excellent. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording, and then I'll hang out for a little bit for those of you with individual questions. Have a great evening. I look forward to seeing you on Friday.